Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practices Show where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all across the country. And as you're getting better as a restorative dentist, one of the things you see all the time is the all on for treatment process and thinking. And I've got my good friend, expert today, Dr. John Crandall from the Dawson Academy. We're gonna talk about, is this fiction or is it fabulous? Because it can be both sometimes. So you cannot miss this. Do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show. Thank you so much for watching. We are crazy, crazy, crazy grateful uh, and uh, love all the requests. And today is no exception. We've got some great stuff coming to your way. You don't want to miss this. Um, right now, currently, there's over 16,000 followers in just three short months, over quarter million video views per week. And over 6,000 of you found us on iTunes. So I'll say this again. I get texts from some of you saying, I'm watching these while I'm driving. Do not watch these while you're driving. Just <laughs> listen to the iTunes versions, okay? So um, I'm loving it. Now, a couple show notes before we jump into the topic and our guest today. We are shooting this live on Facebook. So as you're watching it, if you're watching it live and you have a question, add it to the feed and I'll ask John directly and we'll get the answer from the master himself. Or if you're watching this later on after the live feed, go ahead and continue to add your question to the feed and we'll make sure we get you the right answer because we want you to get the most out of this. Now, today, this is always fun for me. I love this. I get to learn from my mentors and today, one of my favorite mentors and teachers of all time, uh, Dr. John Cranham. And I love, John, how you do things. You're just, you're, you're in the thick of it, sometimes walking the line. And um, I always learn great stuff from you. And one of the concepts that's come up uh, well, actually, before we get into the topic, you know, I'm a big fan of the Dawson Academy. I'm going to have a chance to be with you guys at the Seminar One this Friday. And if you haven't been to the Dawson Academy, you just got to go. It's an amazing place. Uh, it's where I got my start in really trying to understand greater restorative dentistry and the possibilities. And John, you're one of the principals there at the Dawson Academy. If people haven't heard of you, can you share with them a little bit about your story, who you are, and what the Dawson Academy is? Sure. Um, I heard uh, about Dr. Dawson in dental school. So about 1987, uh, I read Pete's first book as a junior dental student in, uh, before I restored my mother's mouth while I was in dental school. So there was a mentor of mine that introduced me to him. And so I heard him in about 89, right out of school, right after I bought my practice and uh, went through the, what everything they had at that time uh, twice. Uh, so the three seminars to twice over two years. And, and then I just went out and started learning from some of the cosmetic people uh, that was sort of starting to get hot in the early 90s. But I definitely built my whole foundation of my practice on Dr. Dawson's principles of occlusion and TMJ. And then as I learned the aesthetic things, I blended that. And uh, it seems strange now, but cosmetic dentistry in the early 90s was not that interested in occlusion. It was like two separate um, you know, entities almost. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I, I, uh, developed a presentation called the cosmetic occlusal connection in 95, uh, and did it for a number of years. And Dr. Dawson heard it in the early two thousands and then invited me into, uh, into the Academy and became, became the clinical director in 08 and, uh, have been one of the primary leaders since. But I think what we do maybe better than anybody is to help doctors that are, very, very good dentists um, that are trying to develop a systematic way of handling more complex cases. So going beyond sort of the quadrant or the single tooth or the three unit bridge and want to begin to tackle uh, more complicated things like where they want to learn how to do an upper arch or a worn dentition case where you're going to be doing many crowns across the front or learn how to take, uh, take care of TMJ patients or do a uh, full arch of implants. Uh, so, yeah. so, you know, which leads us into our conversation today. 
Yeah. So before we go into the details, can you just talk about why this is an important topic? It's a hot topic. And if you're not, let's let's even go far back as if you're not even familiar with all on four, because it's interesting. Some of the young dentists are like they I, they get it conceptually, but take us into why this is such a hot topic. Well, the brand the brand name for all on four really comes from a specific protocol that um, started to get us away from thinking that you needed to to put an, an implant wherever there was a tooth. And if you look at, you know, full arch implant cases from years ago, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't uncommon to see 12 implants or 14 implants in a whole arch. And so it was a real stretch for us when we first started to think about being able to take all the teeth out and on four implants, place a whole arch of, of teeth. Um, and I think for some of us today, they're a little more conservative. The all in four protocol, we might put five or six in, say five in the lower and six up top. But the concept basically is a treatment protocol where you could remove the teeth, place implants, place multi-level abutments, and then immediately load a full arch of teeth on the same day. And so if we look at places like Clear Choice, you know, who's the sort of the corporate entity that's doing a lot of this, um, there just isn't any question that it is one of the hottest things in dentistry, um, mainly for two reasons. And I think the first thing, the reason really that's important to understand is that the population of people that are doing this is the boomers, the boomer boomers that are a little bit older, right. and they really are the first population that do not ever expect to lose their teeth and feel like losing their teeth is kind of unacceptable. Not mm -hmm. to say that there's not dentures being made, but but unlike their parents, a lot of their parents felt like they were going to lose their teeth at some point in their life and it would be okay to have a denture. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what's driving this is a higher, caring more about aesthetics, caring more about function, caring more about health. And so if they are in a bind and have a failing dentition, um, this is a just an amazing option for patients that that want to get their teeth back and, and as close to health and function as we possibly can get. Yeah. Now, with full arch implant dentistry, I have so many questions on this. What's the easiest way? You know, you talk about um, to do these cases, and there's also, there's a hardest, well, let's go to the easiest way. Yeah. So there isn't any question that I think for a doctor that's going to be doing some sort of fixed prosthesis, probably the easiest way to do this is to begin with just an immediate denture. Mm -hmm. So if if somebody has to lose their teeth, uh, most of us, well, not most of us, we're all trained how to do immediate dentures in dental school. So if we can follow that protocol, get the teeth out, get an immediate denture in and verify the tooth position in the denture, uh, then it's fairly easy for us to do some sort of duplicate of that denture with radio opaque teeth, do a CT scan, and then plan the implants from there, and then put the implants in, let them heal, and then transition to a fixed prosthesis. Now, there's still a lot of things that have to be done correctly to get the implants in the right place and ensure you have enough space for the prosthesis, and we'll get into that a little bit. But the 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 reason that's easier is when you are taking all the teeth out, putting all the implants in, and then immediately loading something all in one day, there's just so many places where you can get lost in space, so to speak. And the problem is if you get the implants in the wrong position and you don't have enough space for the prosthesis, or the implants are in such a poor position that you can't utilize them, it's just a disaster for patients. So, you know, that's why the fiction or fabulous thing, this, this I mean, I love doing these cases. I've got a, a full upper and lower tomorrow I'm doing with my surgeon. Um, so I love doing these cases, but but they're hard cases. I mean, there isn't really anything in dentistry that I do that, that tests our ability to treatment plan and visualize where we're going to be at the end and, and think about all the steps that has to occur just in the beginning. And then you have to execute. So, right. so, you know, having a extremely experienced surgeon and then an experienced restorative dentistry that Dennis, that I think it's important that we've done lots of arches on teeth. Um, and then a lab person that knows what they're doing. I mean, all those pieces have to be in place and, you know, so, so the easiest way is to just kind of step by step, 
just do the denture first and then kind of transition to the implant. Hardest way is the way we're going to do it tomorrow. Right. Right. <laughs> and, and the thing that, the thing that makes it dicey though, is that I would love it if my patients would let me do it the easy way. But what's driving a lot of this is patients don't want to be without teeth. They don't want to wear a denture. So mm -hmm. what's driving the market is having the ability to do it, to execute it in a way that they don't ever have to be without teeth. They can come in and get put to sleep or, or sedated and get all this done. And in the course of four or five hours, uh, get it all taken care of. Yeah. And can you paint some light on this or just give some context to this? You and I did a previous show on whether or not GPs should place implants. But if I'm, a, we have a lot of young dentists watch this, a lot of kids. I've got um, some kids I'm mentoring right now in dental school. When they're watching this, they're thinking about a lot of different things. You, what you do is amazing. But if you were to give an advice to a dentist who's on the path to be restorative, how much of this are they going to be doing working with the surgeon? Can you just give us a little bit of context before we go heavy into well, this? Well, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I think concerns me is that there is a, a lot of push, I think, from manufacturers. And, and again, I'm not bashing manufacturers because they're unbelievably helpful. But mm -hmm. I do sometimes think the manufacturers really encourage people that have a denture case to try to go ahead and do it, you know, um, and I, I, there's somebody in town that was one year out that got involved with a case like this and working with the surgeon, but it wasn't planned exactly right. And it ended up in a big old mess. And I came in and helped as much as I could help, but it just put so much stress on the, uh, on that young dentist. And, and I sort of blame the, the person who sort of Made him, led him to believe that if he could make a denture, he could do one of these cases. Right. Um, because again, even if the surgeon does everything right, it's there's still a, this, these cases end up falling squarely on the shoulders of the restorative guy because we in the end have to design the occlusion and adjust it. And and so so what I would just say is that I think that unless you've gone through some training where you have a real specific protocol in your practice of how to visualize in space where teeth need to go from an aesthetic and functional perspective with just teeth, you have to be able to do that. And then yeah. the second thing you have to be able to do is relate that visualization back to the cone beam and then have the conversation with the surgeon and the lab guy where all the implants are going to go. Right. One of the things that just that, that I often remind people is that you need 15 millimeters of space from the incisal edge or the occlusal table of these restorations to the heads of the implants, 15 millimeters of space. So we'll go through a couple of example pictures here in a second, but that means that if the teeth are all over the place, you got to be able to visualize where that edge is going to be. And then on the scan measure up 15 millimeters. So you have to plan after you extract how much bone needs to be taken away before the implants go in. Right. So a lot of people are thinking just direction, but we really need to be thinking about depth too. Right. So whose responsibility is that? Well, I think it's a restorative dentist's responsibility. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, having that team and, and, you know, last time we talked about should GPs be placing implants? Well, I, I, I told, I, I think they should. But maybe not in cases like this, unless you've had a lot of extra training. So these are the true interdisciplinary cases where I want a surgeon that's done hundreds and thousands maybe of implants and, and have seen everything that's possible that can go on. And um, I want a lab person that does this all the time to be present as well. And, and then I want to be there. And so, you know, the other real challenge to this is when you do these cases, where is it going to happen? Um you know, one of the things that I found is from working with multiple doctors is that working, it often happens at the surgeon's office, mm -hmm. but the surgeon's office isn't usually the best equipped to do restorative dentistry and adjust bites. And, and so now we're, we're doing the procedures at my office because we can have a bigger it's kind of surgical op in my place or we can all be there. And then of course, I'm lucky to have a dental lab next door. So right. you know, we sort of have an ideal perspective, but we have to think about that because when I first started to do these cases with surgeons, a lot of times the implants would go in and the surgical assistants were starting to clean up. They're pulling the IV out and I'm just beginning, you know? <laughs> and so it, you know, you have to have conversations about 
when the procedure starts and when it actually ends. And it, it's not just about getting implants in there if we're going to immediately load it. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. So one of my favorite, um, favorite sort of things that Dr. Dawson said years and years ago is that if you want to be a, a master dentist, you have to learn to think like a master technician. Mm -hmm. And I think with these cases, if you want to be a master restorative dentist doing these all on fork cases, you have to learn like a, the think like a master surgeon and a master technician. Everybody's got to understand what the end goal is and, and what everybody's struggles are. Because right. if everybody understands that, then you can often prevent things from getting out of control. Uh, um, as it is now, there's so much cool technology coming out that allows us to do these cases guided so we can do everything in advance and have the provisionals all ready with the holes in it. And, and we'll get into that a little bit, but, but it's still, um, I would just counsel young doctors that just to be careful, um, because there's, there's a huge amount of liability in these cases and we certainly want them to get involved with it, but we can talk a little bit about some of the steps that I think they need to do to get experience and kind of chip away and, and have this maybe be an end goal that they could be doing two years from now. Right. Uh, and that's what I think you would counsel them the same way. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm curious, we're going to go through some of these steps. And the thing I love about the Dawson Academy is everything you guys do, there's a system. There's that's a right. system behind the process. There's a checklist. And I love this. And you might want to speak to this as we go through this. I've had so many people bring this up. Because of the advancements from a digital perspective, some people fear that jumping over the analog, going straight to digital, can be a problem because you certainly don't appreciate the whole process. But, you know, you're in there teaching young dentists all the time. You know, give us some perspective on that because it can lead to the to the to the disaster part of this. Yeah, right? I'm working with a, a really cool company right now uh, that I would encourage everybody to look at called Implant Concierge. And right. uh and it's, a, it's an interesting company because um, we can send them our wax ups and our visualization of where we want the teeth to go and the pre-op model and the scans. And they can, they can merge all that data. So when we look at the CT scan in, in a go-to meeting type format with my surgeon, myself, and the lab, then we can put the implants where they we need to be. And then they can create all the guides and make it all guided. So... You know, once that gets screwed in, there's a bone reduction guide, and then there's a guide to place the implants and a guide to help us get the temps where we need them to be. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I was talking with Brett, who owns the business, um, about the case we're doing tomorrow, and um, and he's so conscientious about making sure everything goes good. And I, and I told him, I said, you know, well, you need to know that, that, that if something is a little bit not 100% of what we expected – we have the ability to call an audible, you know, we mm -hmm. have the ability to, to call an audible and make it work out. And I laughed and I said, I'm like, heck man, you know, five years ago, the whole thing was an audible. I mean, the right. whole thing was the analog is that you didn't, you were kind of looking at the CT, but you pretty much flapped, put the implants where they're supposed to be. And then you were trying to figure out how to retrofit this denture. And that's, I mean, that's what we had. And so those cases were successful. Um, but what I will tell you is, is that as successful as those cases were, the digital thing that gets us so much closer, so much faster with so much less morbidity, mm -hmm. uh, there is, this isn't any question anymore that this is the, this is the way we should be doing it. Um, but it's sort of like, uh, it's sort of like the, the pilot who flies completely by autopilot versus, you know, spending some time and sticking with just stick and rudder, because if you autopilot goes down and, and, you know, you have to be able to, to do things, um, you know, analog, right. I to, let's say by my, by the seat of our pants, but you have to be able to troubleshoot and, and problem solve if the digital thing isn't, is, is a quarter millimeter off or whatever. Right, 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 right. So let's talk about the hardest way to do this, which is what you're going to be doing tomorrow, you know, type of a thing. Take us through the thinking and the process. So uh, let me, let me, I've got about 11 things that I just want to run through here quickly. And then I've got a few slide of uh, pictures that we can throw up there. Cool. Uh, but again, I, in the hardest way is obviously the patient that is is demanding or wanting or driven towards 
um, doing the whole thing in one day. So uh, however many teeth, I think we're taking about 21 teeth out tomorrow and putting in six implants up top and five on the bottom, putting in the multi-levels, immediately loading the upper and lower. Um, it's freaking awesome. I mean, it's so, so fun to do. But it's, How long is this procedure? I'm just curious. I'm just... We'll probably be, we'll start at eight. We'll probably be done about one. You know, okay. a couple hours, a couple hours in arch and, uh, and we're, you know, we're not trying to set any you know, world records or anything, but, um, we take our time and make sure everything's done well. But the first thing with these cases, the reason it's so difficult is not because you can't, you can't take the tooth out and put an implant, though it makes it difficult is how clear you have to be in the treatment planning stage to be able to visualize where the teeth are going to go. And, and so that means you have to start with absolutely perfect preliminary records, impressions, um, face bow, centric relation bites, the wax up, the CBCT, everything about it has to be dead on so that you have the data to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. You've seen in our, in the Dawson Academy, we have our are the, the diagnostic wizard that, that we put our photographs in and, and make a lot of these decisions. And what's beautiful is that the same proto process we go through in planning a veneer case or a wear case to figure out where the incised ledge is and the gingival contours are all the same. We're then just measuring from that incisal edge up to figure out where the heads of the implants are going to go. Mm-hmm. So, so once we go through that, uh, the third thing we're then going to do is then relate that proposed tooth position to the CBCT scan. And that's where implant concierge comes in for us uh, because we can get that data over to them. And then we can have a meeting with myself and the surgeon in the lab uh, to virtually place the implants and, and then fabricate the guides. Right. So, so many of the guides today are also you know, screwed in with, you'll see the pins here in a second. So, um, for instance, if you have teeth present, we can have a guide that goes right over the teeth that snaps in place that puts in the horizontal pins. So when we take the teeth out, the bone reduction guide is fitting in the exact place. And if you can imagine, once it's flapped, the bone that's sticking up above the guide, the bone just gets leveled to that. Mm-hmm. Um, Similarly, the pins will then go in the same place to place the implants. Um, So one of the things that I would say is that being able to virtually place those implants, then as I think restorative dentists, we really should be insisting on guided surgery. Mm Because if we go through all that, those efforts, we definitely want to be doing the, the implants guided so that we can then plan the angulation. So in advance, if we're going to use a multi-level abutment that has a 17 or 30 degree angle on it, we'll know which one we need before the surgery. So we don't have to have, you know, the huge armamentarium. Um, We want to then have a process to carefully place the fixed provisional. And, you know, whether we're using a denture that has holes pre-drilled in it or some sort of PMMA, um, we want to work all that out so that we're not just starting from scratch because the provisional has to be right occlusally. It has to be right aesthetically. And remember that per fixed provisional is going to be, be able to be screwed in and screwed out, but it stabilizes all the implants. So in the all on four five, six, whatever you want to call it protocol, uh, that fixed provisional plays a very important role. Um, I think we should insist on these in these cases that that the day this happens, that the surgeon and the restorative dentist and probably even the lab person is there for the procedure. Right. I see some of these being done where it'll kind of be at the surgeon's office and then it'll go over to the restorative dentist office. But I really think we need to be there together because um, when we're doing them together, I learn so much what his challenges are. And when he hangs around until the case is finished, he learns what my challenges are and we just get better as a Mm -hmm. team. Right. Uh, um, And then one of the things is once the provisionals in, there are some specific clusal guidelines on these cases there, they aren't teeth. So, you know, canine guidance and it doesn't really help these patients. So we follow some old rules that, Carl Mish taught me, I'll call the, 
uh, three S's, which was shared, shallow, and splinted, which just meant our guidance is shared over multiple teeth. Um, we splint the restorations, obviously, and we make the guidance as shallow as possible. So that, that means these type of cases have more of a group function type occlusion. And, and again, for a lot of us, that's a little bit foreign, but it's important because, I, I, again, I'm a firm believer if we lose an implant, uh, a huge part of this can be occlusally related. So we've got to manage that. Right. Um, we got to closely monitor the hygiene and occlusion while the implants are integrating. So getting these patients prepared before anything goes in on how they're going to water pick or whatever you're going to have them to do. But, you know, one of the things that sort of occurred to me after a while is these patients aren't in the position they're in losing their teeth <laughs> because they're good at home care, you know? Right, right, right. So, so it's amazing though how these large treatment plans can be motivational. The mm -hmm. writing of the check can sometimes make them, uh, but they have to be clear. We have to be clear with them that this is their responsibility. We'll teach them how to clean, clean it, but they got to clean it. I mean, it's, we will teach them, but you know, writing a big check doesn't ab absolve them from the responsibility. And so we spend time making sure that in those early stages that they're, they're taken care. Right. And we're going to talk about it in a little bit about how we get these patients in the practice, mm -hmm. Which is a whole nother conversation. And then the only other thing that I would just say is that uh, as the patient's finishing up with the treatment, um, one of the things that we do before we finish the final case, the final process, is we literally have a punch list with our patients. So we come in, we re-photograph them, and then we go through step-by-step step everything they like about the temporaries and everything they'd like to change so that they understand that as a temporary we're going to be get them 90% there, but we'll make some changes to, to improve things. And then as we finish the case, we're just kind of following those standard prosthodontic procedures to make good fitting bars and all that. But as yeah. you say, there's like a lot going on in these right. cases. Now go back to the, the temporary thing, because that is the mark of a true master that's done this a million times. Can you just reiterate why we do that? Like you're, it, it's, it's the whole adage, look, we're going to measure like five times before we cut type of a thing. So well, yeah. And, and, the, and again, bec the only way this works that satisfies the person's goal of not having a denture, I mean, right. the only way this works is that you have to be able to fabricate a provisional that's going to look and feel and chew like teeth and be balanced occlusally. Right. And so you have to remember is that when you take all the teeth out and the patient can now overclose you know, having a way to maintain that vertical or go with whatever vertical you're going to, right. you can lose your way so easily. And so we sort of forget that. That's why I think that, you know, doing a full arch on teeth is somewhat easier because you're still, you know, you're within a millimeter and a half of where they were. You take mm -hmm. all the teeth out, they can go anywhere, you know? Right. So, so I just, you know, I want people, I don't want people to fear this, but I want them to respect this. Right. Because, because this is a major responsibility. Right. And one of the things, you know, me not even being a dentist, but one of the things I love what you teach is talk about managing the forces. Because there's a lot of people out there that teach all of this stuff, but very few people talk about the forces that affect this long term, which is a key piece of all this. You've been hanging out with me for a while. I know. You do this all the time. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Go like this. I love it. I love I it. Get a, I get teased about that. Well, that's right. I mean, I, I think that that's one of the biggest things that we do um, with our at the academy, with the core curriculum. A lot of what we do is teach people to understand that there is a there's some physiology on how the joints, muscles, and teeth are designed to work together mm -hmm. and to recognize how to to create that when it's missing. And we can do right. that with teeth. We can do that on a denture. We can do that on implants. But I think you're right. I think a lot of times that that just isn't thought of completely. Mm -hmm. And so the downside of not thinking about that is that if the jaw to jaw relationship or the vertical dimension or where the implants are in an anterior posterior position aren't right, then often we can't get the prosthesis where it needs to be to handle the forces. Right. And unfortunately, one of the, the, the primary ways that these cases fail then is by losing implants. 
Right. And that's a, I mean, the, the cost of these prosthesis, you know, five, six thousand dollars for a lab bill for an arch, you know, you start losing implants, you lose one and everything is sort of going south on it. So, right. so it's a big part of it. Yeah. And I'll add one more thing too. As a younger dentist, if you're watching this, you already know this, your patients are going to be living a lot longer than John's patients will. I mean, as a country, we're going to be getting older. So when you do this dentistry on somebody and they're in their, you know, fifties or sixties, there's a good chance they're going to live for another 30, 40 years. I mean, yeah. so that's, if not one of the biggest pieces of determining whether or not this is well, going to that's right. I mean, and sometimes the deintegration, I mean, losing an implant's bad, but honestly, what I worry about with a lot of these cases is all the screws breaking. Right. Because if the forces aren't right and the screws break, now you have a screw up in there and the, you know, it, 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 there's just a lot of things that can go on, um, the maintenance. Let me, can I show a few pictures Please, here? Let's yeah. do it. So let's just look at a sample case of, of just some of the things that were going on here. So maybe, Ben, if you can throw up uh, uh, the first picture here. Um, uh, this is a patient of mine, uh, Jose, who is uh, basically a dentalist up top. And what I want you to notice, you go to picture two, that that's the denture up top with the lower incisors that have erupted upward into that worn denture. If you look at picture three, you can really see that. So here again, this is somebody who's driven to have all this taken care of in a day. I uh, wants implants up top, implants on the bottom. And what we have to recognize is that if he's worn the denture out like that, that whole anterior segment has erupted upwards. Mm -hmm. So we have to have a way to figure out where that lower incisal edge position is so then we can measure down south so to speak to figure out how much bone needs to be removed because so because again from wherever our incisal edge is to where the bone's going to be that we need 15 millimeters of space basically to the head of those implants so if you look at picture four here's just some of the pic pictures in our dawson diagnostic wizard and, and we utilize this to look at uh, facial profiles it helps us to look at kind of skeletally where they are and, and also potentially if they're overclosed um, hard on this patient because of the beard. Mm -hmm. uh, the next picture where we go is picture five, which is where we're trying to find the incisal edge position. So looking at pictures like rest and E and the tip down smile and the profile smile. If we go to picture six, this is us visualizing probably about three and a half millimeters of length that we're going to need to the upper incisal edges. And then logically, I'm thinking that the lower incisors probably have erupted about that much. Mm -hmm. So if we look at picture seven, this is the, the picture graphic that we get once we figure out approximately where we want the tooth in space. And, and then on the next picture, it's showing us the lower incisal edge position um, where I'm just marking the starting point. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine on the CT, if I know where the lower incisal edge is, I can measure down about three millimeters and then go from there all the way down to where the, where the bone is going to need to be tabled. Now up top, we basically go to picture nine. Um, we've got a diagnostic denture that we're making. And then we have this little, uh, this is this uh, CCAT surgical guide uh, or this, um, I'm sorry, the CCAT little plate that goes on that has the fiducia markers built into it. And what we do is we um, basically duplicate the denture with radiopaque teeth. So when you go to picture 10, we can now plan, we can see where the teeth are going to be in space at the end, and we can plan specifically where the implants are going to go. And we can even plan the horizontal pins that will stabilize the guides. Now, this is using the older technology that I did with Serona uh, with implant concierge. It's even gone beyond that. On the bottom, we have a lower scan that uh, internal scan that superimposes over the CBCT where we can do similar measurements. Um, again, saying a different angle on picture 11. And I actually have a duplicate on 12. Sorry about that. But let's go to 13 and you can see what these guides look like. So the upper teeth didn't need to be removed. So this guide can literally go in like a denture the horizontal pins screws right into the jawbone, 
And if you go to picture 14, uh, the surgeon basically goes right through it, punches the tissue, places the implants to the depth that we exact depth that we go to on the low uh, uh, on the CT. And again, the same process can be done on the bottom. A little different because the teeth have to come out. So there's different ways that we stabilize that. But in the old school, if you go to picture 15, what we did was we would essentially make a denture and cut holes in the denture based on where the implants are. Well, now we're coming to surgery with the prosthesis with the holes already in it because mm -hmm. we know precisely where the implants are going to go. But if we go to the last picture... When the patient's waking up after surgery, this is where we are. So, you know, we end up with patient has a whole new mouth with the teeth in the ideal wow. position. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to look good aesthetically, but also be able to then equilibrate this in a way that we have the ideal function with the shared shallow and splinted uh, that, that Carl taught me all those years ago. So, you know, that... That's just sort of a nutshell. So if you think about all the visualization goes on advance and then transferring it to cone beam, being able to figure out where the implants will go, then execute that, there's a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. And if the implant doesn't get in the right angle or it gets not deep enough, you know, then the lab doesn't have enough space and, you know, we end up having, and it goes to the not so fabulous part of it. Right. Right. So when you look at the pitfalls, I mean, what are some of the major pitfalls you would just to stay? I mean, it's easy to go. Don't go to the disastrous side yet, but like clear pitfalls that you so would I think say. The, big, so the biggest pitfall is, I think, is trying to go too fast. You right. Know, understanding that this is not this is a prosthetically driven discipline. We hear people saying that a lot, um, but I don't see even people talking about it being prosthetically driven discipline, I still see people taking shortcuts on the diagnostics and on the planning. Uh, and so, you know, it's kind of like the pilot with 3,500 hours that stops using the checklist because right. he's a great pilot. And so, mm -hmm. you know, like you say, measure five times, cut once. So I, I, I can't reiterate that enough. I also think maybe trying to do these cases without a clear protocol, a clear mm -hmm. process where everybody knows what their role is. And um, so I, I would really suggest that as you develop your interdisciplinary team and you have one of these cases, really meet and discuss all the things that are going on. The third thing that I would say is um, probably just patient selection. Uh, right. The patients that I've, I've run into some problems with are, are chronic smokers that this promised me up one side down the other that they're going to quit. I've got one right now that's lost an implant that, you know, not on the permanent, thankfully, but we're going to have to take a step back and, and wait for an implant to integrate. Um, so I think conversations with patients about what their responsibility really is and what the risks are. Sometimes we really want to do these patients and we maybe don't, we might sugarcoat it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think that patient selection, particularly with with your experience level, you know, patients that are have really destroyed their teeth for functional reasons. Well, maybe that's not your first all on four case, right? They're going to put pressure on your implants too. Yeah. So. The other thing you taught me so well is it isn't necessarily biologic health. You've got to look at psychological health too, yeah. because there. I mean, when you get better, like you have, you have the potential to attract crazy people, right? I no. Mean, no, <laughs> not you, because I do want to segue into how the heck do we attract these kind of people, but then also you've got to let wisdom take over a little bit in this and not let your ego go, ooh, here we go. I mean, there's there's some discretion. There's some, you know, there's a lot of pieces to this that you've learned a hundred times. You're like, okay, I mean, you were the one, people have heard me use your your joke in lectures, like when a woman pulls out a shade guide in a consult, you're the one that gave me that, you know, you just let her keep talking because your fee's going way up. Like I, or, I, I listen or, very or carefully. I can, or I can decide, you know, one of the, the freeing things that does happen when you get a little experience on you is the understanding that at the consult, the patient's kind of evaluating you right. to see if you're the one that's going to be doing this. But I think it's totally okay 
for us to be also evaluating them mm -hmm. if they're fit for the practice. Because we, if any, if we're honest, every dentist that's practiced even a little bit of time has gotten a relationship with somebody that they wish they hadn't. Right. You know, and it starts to eat your stomach lining out and all that stuff. And so these type of cases, I think we really have to think about that. Um, we have to really make sure that the patient is ready and is going to be able to go through some things. And, and again, I, I have all the respect in the world for people that go through this road because it's not for the faint of heart. This is major undertaking. I'm amazed how well they do. I mean, you think about that, 20 some teeth being removed and implants and grinding part of your jaw away and you call them the next day and they're doing pretty good. You know, I mean, it's amazing. Um, but, but I do think that that patient selection thing. And, the, and then also, if, if it's a patient that you really want to do, how do we talk to them in a way that makes them want you because what I'm finding is that these patients that are thinking about this, they don't go to one place, right? You know, they often have three or four consults. They're going to be spending 50, 60, 70, 80,000, you know, whatever it is, be spending some big change. And they understand, uh, they understand that this isn't like getting in a filling, you know, right. Um, right. Well, so, well, can you answer those two questions? So first of all, how do you attract these people? And then how do you talk to them in a way that they do yeah. want you? So this is fabulous instead of fiction. You know? I actually think the way you, you, you start is there's usually somebody or people within your practice that may ask you about it, that, right. that are sort of have some big time perio problems. Um, they may be you know, you may be nursing them along and you're kind of getting to that point. And I think in your own practice, you can start educating patients on the possibility of some of the options that are mm -hmm. out there. And that's really where I started. And then when you get a few of those, just document everything about it so that when you get done with that, you end up with a raving fan for the procedure that you did. And you know, they can write up a little thing and you can get some pictures for your website or, or whatever. I, I find that a lot of these patients that come in now from, say, our website, because we've got some of those people up there, uh, the before and afters, and just their story, you know, I find if you market their story, people read the story and honestly, they don't care where we went to school and what we play. They want to know that there are people in your practice that you made happy. Mm-hmm. Right. And if there's evidence of success, they often can read the testimonial from the story from the patient and they identify with those patients. So they'll often come in and say, you know, I read about Brenda's story. That's why I'm here. And what's crazy is sometimes when they read the story, that story is almost as powerful as a word of mouth referral. Wow. That's crazy, isn't it? So yeah. they can tell that they can tell by the authenticity. That's why I like the, the stories to be written by the, if they'll write it. I want it written by the patient or video is even better if you can get mm -hmm. somebody to go on video and tell their story. Um, but bottom line is uh, that's sort of where it goes. And then I think that the way we make them um, want to be with you, how you separate yourself is with the due diligence of your exam and the protocols that you go through to determine where teeth go. So for us, taking really good photographs and being really picky about our model work and then sitting down with our wizard, our Dawson Diagnostic Wizard, and showing them where their teeth are and then showing them maybe similar type patients that were, you know, had something done. But, but I like to show my patients the science behind smile design and, and, right. and, and how we're going to change the tooth position and get their feelings about, about what I'm thinking. That's mm -hmm. such a different experience that when the patient walks in on the first visit, the doc kind of looks in their mouth and go, yeah, we can do it at 60 grand. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, uh, you know, it, it doesn't smell the same as the person who's really being careful with their, with their workup. Right, right. And, and the other thing that you've taught me so well that I love is use the word thinking. You have designated time to sit down and think where you have very little distractions. You have your cup of coffee. You're looking at everything because it goes ten, 10 times better than just 
winging it and going right in there, putting it all together and calling it co-discovery. And I find this to be true with our young dentists, and I'm sure you do too. Everyone could do so much better if they just slowed down just a little bit, you know, yeah. or a lot. Yeah. And, and I think, and I, you know, I used to think that, that it, we always had to be slow. I, I do think that there, there's times in our practice when we're doing more primary care dentistry fillings and stuff. If we organize our schedule so that there's sort of aerobic time where you can move a little quicker and, mm -hmm. uh, but there's clearly times when we're doing cases like this or doing our diagnostics or consults where you have to be one at a time. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, we like to talk about, about general dentistry and specialty dentistry in our practice. And, and I think for a lot of us, um, at least for me anyway, I think there was, I had a vision that there would be a time when I would only do specialty dentistry. Mm -hmm. And it, and it's kind of getting close to that now because I have somebody with me who, who's, who's a younger dentist who's doing a lot of the general stuff. But for a long time, I, I split it. You know, I, I had a couple of days where I was doing the nuts and bolts and I had a couple of days that I was doing the specialty. Um, it was equal time, you know, but probably 80% of the income from the practice came on the two days that I was doing the, the specialty stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But I still had to do that other, I mean, that other stuff was important. I still had to do the fillings, still had to, you know, check hygiene and do all the things. And, and, uh, and I like, I love the balance of that. Yeah, absolutely. Take us into the future when it comes to the all on four concept. What do you think we're going to start seeing a little bit more of maybe a year from now, two years from now on this concept? Well, I don't think there's any question that the digital revolution, we are in the mix of it right now. Um, I think the guided stuff is going to get so good. And you see a little bit of it right now where in certain cases that you can virtually make the prosthesis that actually will fit on the implant. So, mm -hmm. you know, imagine being able to put a guide over somebody, place the implants, put the abutments on, and literally just screw the prosthesis in place without having to pick anything up in their mouth. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's going to become more and more of a reality as our guided procedures get, get better and better and better. Um, I think that the trend towards guided surgery being the absolute standard of care is, you know, it's, it's there. And mm -hmm. so I think more and more you're going to see cone beam prices come down. I think probably within five to 10 years, cone beam is going to be pretty standard in general practices. Right. Um, I think that you're going to see that technology evolve to be able to have caries detection. So we may even stop doing interoral photo, uh, intraoral um, radiography at all. Um, but, but I think that, you know, in the end <laughs> that what this, what will never change is the dentist ability to learn where teeth are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a mouth that's completely destroyed, you have to pay the price to have a protocol in your practice to first do that. And that just goes so far because it is something that, um, that lends itself to, to everything cool about being a dentist. Yeah. Uh, you know, veneers, crowns, you know, all the things that we do, these big implant cases. Uh, that's the life changing stuff that I love. Yeah. And it's cool because you guys are all consistent learners. I've never heard any one of you say, Oh, I've got it all figured out. We've mastered yep. everything. You're always on this journey. And I've heard this from so many different people. When you learn to enjoy the process, like the process of getting better, you really love what it yields, which is way beyond anything you could ever dream. When you focus on the yield, you don't really, you kind of skip over the process and you guys are always on that process of, of learning more. And then the other thing I just want you to have to speak about before we you know, we kind of bring this to a close. Sometimes people, when they hear this subject, they're thinking this is all you do all day long. And you spoke to it a little bit, but really talk about the brain space and the number of cases you handle per month. I heard you say a long time ago, there's about only eight of them you can fit in your brain per month at the most. I mean, you're not yeah, I mean, it's dealing less than with that. You know, let's less, less than that now. I'm <laughs> can you older. explain what that means? Because you don't yeah. have like 15 cases going on at one oh. time. It's too much to think about, right? Yeah. So if I can have on a great month, if I can be doing the regular things that I do, and I'd say six to eight, 
is okay. the starts. And, uh, and that might be people that have been in the practice a little bit, but, but I'm, right. it's finally getting to the point where we're prepping or whatever like that. And that could be an eight unit case and equilibration. It could be an upper arch. It could be, but you know, it's usually significant type dentistry. And, and what's really cool is a lot of these cases now uh, have an implant component to it, mm-hmm. you know, more and more. So, so my practice is balanced a lot now between these type of cases and then the TMJ patients that come in. So right. a lot of my new patients now are facial pain patients also, which involve cone beam and diagnosis and a lot of times splint therapy, getting them stabilized and then having some sort of either restorative ortho or equilibration type component after that. Um, more and more, a lot of the nuts and bolts things were are, are done by my uh, the dentist that's with me. Uh, but for a long time, it was all of that. Um, mm-hmm. As you kind of gave me a hard time earlier before we went on, uh, I'm starting to take Mondays off now so that I have a desk day to work on seminar things. And uh, Yeah, and so talk- if you're watching this, he texts me. He's like, I'm ready to go. And I'm like, well, I got a full day. He's like, well, I'm going to go golf. <laughs> <laughs> just nine minutes. Oh <laughs> man, it just made me so mad because it's yeah. a beautiful day. Yeah. So, um, so three days a week and then, you know, I still am teaching about 60 to 70 days a year. So that's a big yeah. part of what we do as well. That's awesome. Now, um, and again, it, it, as you, as you embrace this journey, I just want to reiterate something you said before is really just documenting, having a process, a checklist in which when you do these things, you're creating evidence for what you do. And John, that was one of the turning points in your career. You had this epiphany that you're like, wow, I really, I need to start documenting what we're doing so that it's evidence so I can speak about it confidently to people. And over time, people start to seek you out for this. They see you as the expert. And that's where your hands and your heart and your head all come together and you go, gosh, I was I was built for this type of a thing in your career. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I do. And I think that the other thing that um, so much about photography, it's not just about the documenting to show people, but it's the way you get better. I mean, right. uh, I heard Frank Spears say that years ago, that he felt like the, the camera was the most important thing, his most important tool. And I don't know if it's my most important tool, but it's up there. I mean, articulator, there's a lot of things that we have that are extremely important. But in terms of getting better, you know, you start taking pictures of everything you do. There's a lot of things that look pretty good at speaking distance and you put it up on a big color monitor and it's not looking quite as good. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I, I like what you said. I mean, I, I look at, um, I still, my charge is the, in dentistry is the thing that fires me up the most is when I noticeably improve. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love, I love the feeling that, that I'm learning something new and we're getting better at it and mastering it. And when we start to master it, then I want to add something new to the practice. Um, you know, with GB Black, what do you say? We're, you know, it's a, you have your dental license as a license to learn or become a continuous student or whatever you said. But it's great. Uh, yeah. yeah. But I, I see, I still see today, um, you know, with some of the younger dentists that I've been with, there's so much financial pressure and I get that. But, just trust the fact that if you love your patients and if you solve their problems and you commit to getting better, the money takes care of itself. It That's, always does. Pete yeah. said two amazing things in the first day that I met him. He said, money is the byproduct of doing the right thing yep. with the right people, which I've found to be absolutely true in 20 years. Amen. And at the end of the course, I asked him, I said, Dr. Dawson, what's the one piece of advice you would ever, what's the one thing you know for sure? He goes, hmm. He said, I would say this, don't ever say you have it all figured out because two things, Kirk, when you don't have it all figured out, it keeps you hungry, keeps you engaged. And he said, the other thing is any dentist that has it all figured out, they're not that much fun to hang around with. So (laughs) I found that to be true. So if you're a young dentist watching this and you want to get better, you know, two things. Number one, John, you guys actually have a course on full arch for implants. Can you just talk about that real quick? Yeah. So the full arch, um, the full arch class. Uh, it was developed really for uh, our students that have been through it, but also for doctors that uh, are wanting to see a protocol in place. So they don't have to be, um, you know, have gone through the core curriculum to do this class. Uh, but it's uh, a two-day class. We will actually have uh, two patients of ours that we've gone through. It's cool because they'll actually have the 
printed jaws of, of the actual patients that we've worked on. So uh, they will see video of the process of, of, of how we work the case up. Uh, we'll go online with, with, uh, and show how we figure out where the implants will go. And then they will actually do the steps on the printed jaws of getting the implants in, picking the multi-levels, and immediately loading these cases and then seeing video of what we actually did. Mm -hmm. So so it's really, it's a hands-on class. It's limited to just 20 folks. Um, and if a doc wants to come and bring a surgeon, that's, that's really encouraged. Uh, but it's really to take somebody through the whole protocol and learn a systematic approach to doing this. And, mm -hmm. and again, sort of the Dawson way. So obviously heavy focus on both aesthetics and the occlusal design. Right. So, yes. and then, um, you know, there's a link in there in the show notes. If you want more information, just check it out and just go. Yeah. And then, yeah and then also too, if you're just looking, f you know, one thing, it's not so much just the education. If you're looking to really create a spark on your journey, this is a great way to do it. Dawson seminar one, mm -hmm. and, which I'm going to be at this Friday, which I love. Can you just speak about that? If, if I'm a young dentist or even let's say I'm a mature dentist, cause I do get this and I toss this question to you all the time. What if I've been practicing for 15 years and I don't want to go back through the beginning? I mean, what, what solutions do you have for me in that respect? So, so here's the, here's the thing. So seminar one, I, it, it would, it, for everybody that goes, it's life changing because it right. does take a lot of the things that I think maybe were thrown around a little bit in dental school. And what we do is we distill it down to get a very clear picture and protocol of how to look at patients that have more systemic problems. What I mean by that is problems with the masticatory system, whether it's a joint problem or a wear problem, but the patient whose bite is obviously not working and how to take that patient and what records we need to get in addition to the standard general dental exam right. uh, to be able to design something that's going to be more stable. And so it fits so beautifully for the doctors that are wanting to do more complex procedures. Um, obviously, having the ability to solve more complex problems does directly relate to the bottom line of your practice and profitability and all those things. Mm -hmm. But I think I think a lot of doctors that are also trying to get away from insurance um, and become more, uh, you know, fee for service type practice, which I think a lot of people want. I just don't know how you do that today without being able to solve more complex problems. I don't know how you think about that, but uh, you know, if you want to have that possibility in your practice, you can't do it with just hype. You have to be able to solve more complex problems. And so our core curriculum is, is a series of classes, but seminar one is the place to start. What I would say for the doctor that maybe has been out for a little bit and maybe has even been to some other places and want a flavor for what we do at the academy, I still encourage them to come to seminar one. They right. can do it in online or they can do it in person. And I know you've got the links for that as well. Um, but I think that's a great place for us to take you through the big picture of what we do and make sure you have all the pieces in place. And from there, we can customize what additional classes might be necessary. You wouldn't have to go through the whole curriculum prob probably, but yeah. depending on where your practice is and what you do, there's uh, a mix of a few things that we can design for sure. Yeah. Do you have time for one more question? we got a great question from Australia here. Yeah. Okay. So Arjun asked, uh, having difficulty uh, with patients accepting treatment when I see the signs of instability. I know what needs to be done, but patients feel it's a lot of treatment for a small sensitivity or a little wear of teeth. Any tips on how to handle that? Yeah. So I think with, with the most important thing, and this is something that Pete has taught me is make sure that when you're describing a problem with the masquery system, that we also describe the implication of the problem. So for instance, where, if we show a patient that a tooth is wearing a little bit, where is a tough one for a patient because they can still chew that often doesn't hurt and they don't have any context for it's a big, a big deal. So one of the things I'll tell a patient is, if I can see dentin, I explain to the patient that, that in order to get to dentin, you've lost two millimeters of tooth structure. And once you get to dentin, the wear is now seven to nine times faster, depending on the study. So what the patient has to understand is that wear is an indication that things are not stable. Now, 
for our, what's our friend in Australia's name? Arjun. Yeah, so for Arjun in Australia, um, the one thing to remember about these pro these type of conversations is sometimes we get frustrated if the patient doesn't act the first time we tell them. These type of, these type of things often take a little while to sort of get into the patient's head. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we talk about planting seeds. It's important to not get discouraged when the patient's coming back for cleanings and whatnot to be able to remind them the things that you're concerned about. Um, but what I found is sometimes with some patients, something catastrophic has got to happen, mm -hmm. is that they may have those things go on, and then all of a sudden one day a cuss breaks off. And when you know that your communication skills are getting good, is the patient will call and say, I don't need a crown. I need that bite analysis thing Dr. Cranon's been talking about. Right, right. And yep. so, so just keep doing it. I mean, the bottom line, uh, Arjun, is to just keep talking about these signs of instability. And what will happen is all of a sudden it starts to become part of your culture, your practice, because your team will start doing it. And that's mm -hmm. the other thing we, we underestimate is the importance of the hygienist to understand where mobility, migration, sore muscles, and joints, instability is part of that too. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome answer. Awesome question. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So cool. So if you're watching this, John Stam, for just a few minutes, you know, great, great topic, great information. couple things. If you enjoyed today, do me a favor and hit the share button, share it with your friends because we'd love to have it out there and uh, just help this great profession of dentistry that we love. Also, if you have questions for Dr. Cranham, he is fantastic and an incredible mentor, friend. Like I said, just reach out to him. Uh, he will, uh, he'll answer those questions. Um, and uh, keep sending us suggestions. I'm going to have John back quite a bit for a lot of different things. If there's a topic you'd love to hear from Dr. Cranham, send it to us and we'll make it happen because we've already got, I think, 10 more topics lined up and some pretty juicy ones too. So it's mm -hmm. good stuff. Um, and uh, so until we see you next time, keep watching the best practice show. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, you guys. Thanks.